Carnivore Soldier coming at you from Austin, Texas. Today I'm going to go over my first 30 days of carnivore. What I experienced, some of the victories I had, some of the failures and stumbling blocks. Maybe help you on your way in your first 30 days. So I'm not going to lie, the first week of the carnivore experience was really difficult for me. I had a lot of cravings and withdrawal symptoms. They call it the keto flu, but it's really carbohydrate addiction, withdrawal symptoms. And that's what I was going through because, you know, I, I like most people, ate 70% of my calories from carbohydrates and I was definitely addicted. And I was never a moderator. I was a binger. Basically, if I opened a thing of cookies, I was eating some cookies, you know, maybe not the whole pack, but most of it. If I was open a bag of chips, I could easily eat a bag of chips with some dip, watching a football game or something. So that was me. And I knew my body. Now I had gone on the keto diet uh, years ago and it was pretty successful. Although towards the end, I started re-moderating back in what they call keto foods, which really are processed foods and slowly fell back off and gained the weight again. So I think this is a much more sustainable way of going after being over 160 days into it. Uh, but the first 30 days were still very tough. And uh, I just want to give you guys some heads up. Some of the things I did when I was going through the keto flu and I had the headaches, the sluggishness, the low energy, and the really bad cravings, I would go to pickle juice, dill pickle juice. I bought a gallon of it and I would just take a few ounces of pickle juice every now and then throughout the day for the first week or so, maybe 10 days. And I know that's not strict carnivore, but you know what? For me, it was an acceptable bridge to get me over because I finally weaned off it and just went to water and salt. And uh, yeah, you could go water and salt right in the beginning. For me, I just like that, that taste and uh, it had all the electrolytes I needed. The only thing you have to add is magnesium to your diet, but I wasn't cramping in the first couple weeks anyway, so I wasn't really magnesium deficient. It was really just the salts because you're going to go to the bathroom quite a bit when you start. The first 30 days, you're going to be peeing a lot. And that's because the inflammation leaves the body. And you start releasing all that retention of water. So don't be surprised if in the first week you lose, like I did, 11 to 14 pounds for sure. I mean, and that's mostly water weight, but it's because inflammation is leaving your body. You're becoming less inflamed and your body just is just starting to turn a quarter on being able to heal itself and you know some other things are happening too there's a lot of stuff happening in your body at this point the keto flu is definitely not fun and uh the carbohydrate addiction withdrawals are real you just have to get through it how do you make sure you get through it well at first you have to have a really strong why right if you don't have a strong why you're probably going to end up quitting or cheating if you have a strong enough why and then you make a plan with goals around that why then you can do it. And your why should be something big, not just weight loss. I mean, that's, that is a goal. It's not your primary goal. Weight loss will just happen. For me, it was health. Uh, it was for being there for my son. I wanted to watch him grow, become a young man, get married, do all the things that, you know, every parent wants with their kids. For you, it could be anything, it, you know, could just also, I wanted a, an excellent quality of life. I saw my dad getting older and struggling with health and his wife. And I didn't want that for myself as I, you know, got older. I wanted a vibrant life of exceptional quality. And that was, that's part of my why. Anyway, that's, that's kind of how you start the first week. You start the first week, it's tough. Things I ate the first week. I switched to all meat and I would eat, I mean, I'd fry up a pound of bacon at once and I put it in a bag in the fridge and I would call that my bag bacon. I'd snack on that regularly and I would have cheeseburgers. If I wanted to go out because I didn't feel like cooking, I'd go to Wendy's and get their Baconator with cheese triple stack with just plain in a bowl. You can order it just plain in a bowl and they just the burgers, the cheese and the bacon. You have to make sure you tell them no condiments, no vegetables, no bread, just plain in the bowl and they will give it to you. And I would salt it up and eat that if I was out in the road or I'd go to In-N-Out Burger and get their Flying Dutchman, which is, you know, two burger patties with cheese and I get three or four of those and eat them. So Burgers were big. And then I started getting into ribeyes and grilling them. But I found the uh, air fryer recipe. And I think Dante from Fregno Freedom showed me uh, that one. And I ended up doing a, a couple of frozen ribeyes in, it, in an air fryer. And I had a really bad air fryer when I started. So I bought a good one, which there's a link for it on my website. If you guys are interested in which ones I use, I have two. 
I have a Kasori and I have a Power XL. Power XL is my ribeye one and the Kasori one I use for other stuff. Yeah, once I started air frying ribeyes, that was a game changer, especially when they're frozen. Because being a single guy, not having to plan or prep for meals, just being able to walk around the day and then when I get hungry, go to the freezer, get grab a frozen steak, season it, and throw it in a preheated air fryer. And 20 minutes later, I have an amazing ribeye. You know, that was a game changer for me. Anyway, so the first week, yeah, steaks. I ate some chicken, I ate some pork besides bacon, but mostly it was red meat, burger, and bacon. That was kind of the, what I did. And uh, it worked pretty well because I lost a lot of weight doing that. I did grab some chomps too. I was snacking. I was in the snacking phase the first week. A lot of snacking. I did way more snacking than I do now. I don't, I barely snack at all. I also ate butter. Sometimes I would get slices of butter and I would get uh, pork rinds and I put a slice of butter on a pork rind and eat one or two of those. And those taste to me mouth, you know, sensation wise, like a saltine with butter used to when I was, you know, on the standard diet, which I hadn't eaten since I was a kid, but I used to eat those at my grandpa's house. And uh, I love the saltine and butter. So it gives you that same texture and that same experience and actually very satiating. So I would just eat two or three of those and that would be a snack and I'd be done. And that would hold me over to the next meal. So I would say I was snacking six to eight times a day. I was snacking quite a bit and drinking a lot. I was drinking a lot of water. I had given up all sweeteners because I knew from my experience with a uh, keto diet that artificial sweeteners really drove my cravings. So I eliminated all sweeteners. I wanted to kick the cravings. Now the cravings were there for the first week. I'm not going to lie. They were there, but I knew they were going to be there. So I kind of knew what I was going to be going up against. Right. So I mentally prepared myself and said, all right, this is the way it's going to be. Whenever I want something sweet. One of the things I went to was Topo Chico's one, because it's a mineral water. So it has a lot of minerals that we need. And two, because it was carbonated and the carbonated drink acted as uh, I don't know, it'd fill me up. It would stop me. If I wanted a snack, sometimes I grab one of those and drink it. By the time I was halfway through, I didn't want snack anymore. And I think that's another uh, tip too, that when you're coming off the snacks, you can start recognizing those snack signals. And some of them are emotional, some are physiological. Sometimes you're actually hungry, but sometimes it's just, you know, I'm bored, I'm sitting here. I work from home, so it'd be like, you know, I'm, I'm bored sitting here, I just wanna eat something. So go to the fridge, instead of getting the snack, pick up the Topo Chico, come back, start drinking it. That will go away or distract yourself with a task. You know, go do some laundry, wash some dishes, clean the kitchen, just go out and then mow the lawn or do some things out in the yard and you will forget about the snack and it'll, it'll pass. And when that happens, you know, that's an emotional trigger. So yeah, you have to learn your body again and be ready to fight those cravings and have some tools in your arsenal to do so. And which one of the things is I say, drinking water, drinking pickle juice also is one of those things I used. Drinking the Topo Chico is one of the things I used or distracting yourself with a task, doing something at work, just get past that signal. And once you get your brain on something else, a lot of times those hunger signals will go away. Okay, some of the other negatives I experienced from the first week of carnivore were one, obviously my gut. When you change from processing carbohydrates to fats, you do what's called fat adaptation. When I started, I was like checking my ketones every day and doing all these things I used to do in keto to see if I was becoming fat adapted. That happened pretty quickly as far as ketones. My ketones level spiked out after probably four days to the highest level I could read on my meter. And then they just stabilized. So I stopped using that at that point. But I did notice that I had some loose bowels and that was probably my gut biome turning over and you, you know, discharge the old bacteria that dies off that's used to eating sugar and, and you know, get a healthy colony of bacteria in there for processing fats and proteins that normally that we're supposed to eat. For the first week, I definitely had a lot of changes in my, my bowels and don't trust a fart. I've heard that. And you can dial that in with adding and removing fats to your diet too, because I was eating a lot of butter and uh, that definitely loosened my stools and softened my stools. Uh, over time, I just started dialing it in. And I, then I was like really curious because I wasn't going to the bathroom very often anymore. I was only going every two or three days. And that became my new normal. 
And when I did go, it was very little, very little waste. And that was something else I've never experienced before either. Even on a keto diet, because I was eating salads and all this other stuff and a lot of processed uh, you know, seed oils in my dressings and dips and all these things. You know, I'd never experienced digesting almost all my food. And that's what I experience now. So now it's very normal for me and each person will be different, but for me to go two or three days without going. And then when I go have a very small bowel movement, I mean, that's normal because I am digesting almost everything. There's very little waste left over, which is really a great feeling. Uh, I, I can eat a full meal. My stomach is never unpleasantly full. Like it used to be like, you know, the, think of the Thanksgiving feeling, right? Where you're just hurting. Never like that. I can eat a huge ribeye and I just stop getting hungry and I stop eating or finish it. And I'm, I'm full, but I still feel like I could go out and run a mile or two and not like, oh, I can't barely move out to unbutton my top button. That's never the feeling I've ever gotten eating carnivore. So it's, it's, a, it's a different paradigm that you develop in the bathroom. You definitely save money on toilet paper uh, for sure. And uh, that's always a good thing. Some other things that happened in the first week, my sleep patterns weren't awesome. And that's because I was peeing a lot. I even tried not drinking as much, but you still end up getting up in the middle of the night, or at least I did, getting up in the middle of the night to pee quite a bit. And that broke my sleep up. And sometimes I wouldn't be able to go right back to sleep. I think my body was just like going through withdrawals. I mean, basically it's going through withdrawals. So expect to have a little problem sleeping. So what I ended up doing was trying to take some naps during the day every now and then. If I could, if I could get 20 minutes down, that really helped a lot. And eventually my sleep did even out, but in the beginning, you know, it was tough and I, I'm an early riser anyway. So I'm, I'm a four thirty five o'clock AM riser with my dog, you know, it's probably from my time in the service, but some mornings I'd wake up at two and go to the bathroom and be up till, you know, three and then go back to bed and get up at five. So it was like, it was, it was some broken sleep in the first week or two. So I think that covers most of the negatives. The negatives being the keto flu is the, the big negative and then a little bit of bowel issues. Uh, and with, you know, the keto flu again is just energy levels, low headaches, you know, it's feeling like general crap that happened, but there were some positives that happened too. You know, one of the positives that I noticed was really strange was I stopped sweating easily. I used to sweat at the drop of a hat. I could do any physical activity and just start sweating profusely. When I started this after the first week, I would be out doing stuff and like washing my car or doing stuff out in the yard when it was hot out and not sweat. And I was like, wow, that's. That's so different. That's, that's never been the case for me ever. I was always a heavy sweater and to not sweat felt great. Uh, I mean, not sweat through your shirt and stuff that felt awesome. Now, you know, I do sweat. If I go out and put that 40 pound pack on my, uh, my vest and I ruck, you know, and hike, I will definitely sweat. I will sweat through, but that's a lot of work. And it's usually when it's humid. So sweating was one thing that, that definitely changed, not sweating so much. Also, I would say that uh, my, uh, my energy levels and, and my motivation towards the end of that week, the first, you know, seven to 10, after seven days, up to 10 days, I started feeling energy level coming back. Right. But during that first seven to 10 days, I wasn't very motivated. Uh, I was not very energized to do things after that. That's when I got a surge of energy and a surge of motivation. Not everyone's the same way. My son did it. It took him probably three weeks to get that energy level back. But for me, it was between day eight and 10, I think is when I really noticed that energy level coming back. Some other positive things. Did I stop snoring? I hear Carrie at Homestead Howe talk about that all the time and JT. No, I don't know if I stopped snoring. I just don't know because I'm single. I'd never, you know, my ex-wife never told me I snored. Uh, she said I breathe loud sometimes, but not snored. But I don't know if anything changed on that front. I started losing weight. So of course I was fitting better in my clothes because they were, you know, as any fat person will tell you, you stay with the clothes as long as you can. My clothes were definitely being maxed out when I started this and they were fitting very well, kind of loose towards the end of the first week. And that was a victory. And of course on the scale, losing, you know, 11, 12 pounds in, in a week without ever being hungry. That was a new paradigm too. I had always done the macro counting and stuff and other diets and always been hungry. And, and this is what I thought I justified it. Well, that's what losing weight feels like, right? That's the mental thing. You know, that means I'm losing weight because I'm hungry. 
In this way of eating, that's not the case. In this way of eating, you eat until you're pleasantly full. You eat until you're satiated and you eat whenever you're hungry. Right? Now, hungry is not emotional snacking. So this is where you have to learn your body and learn your hunger signals again. So I had a lot of hunger signals that were probably really emotional snacking. So I probably snacked way too much. Well, I know I did because now I don't do it as much. So a lot of that was emotional snacking. And you're gonna have to understand and figure out what's an emotional snacking signal and what's a real hunger signal. And again, use the distraction, the replacement techniques, you know, replace your snacking with a water and distract yourself with work, you know, or a, a sparkling water. So these are the things you have to do to get through that. But once you get through it, it's pretty awesome. So some of the things I wish I would have done better on the first 30 days, uh, one of them is planning. And by planning, I mean, you know, you're still going to have a social life. You're still going to go out and do things. If you're going to go out on a social event, like I actually went out on some dates in the first two weeks while I was on this. And I just explained to him, hey, I just eat, I'm on a carnivore diet or I'm on a zero carb diet. And I just eat this way. I would have ate before I went out on those dates probably. And then just, you know, ordered some small burger. Uh, with cheese on a plate and that's it and that way well a, it's cheaper which is all obviously always a go and you're still participating in the social event but you know you're not you're not hungry when you get there so you don't feel the need to eat chips or eat whatever they put on the table bread and you don't feel so awkward you just wait for your meal and you feel fine so i think you know planning is a big deal having food ready to go like i said making the bacon i did that and that was good I would have gone to Topo Chico earlier. I went to it a little bit, like halfway through the first week. I would, have, I would have stocked up that Topo Chico. I couldn't empty my cabinets completely because my son was still visiting me and I didn't want to force him to transition to some weird diet that he didn't go for. So I did clear out anything that was not something he ate from my cabinet and took it to the local food pantry. You know, killing two stones in one, you know, I'm getting rid of the temptation and I'm also doing a charitable act for people that are really in need. And that food, while it's not great for you, it will keep you from starving. So I think that was, you know, the thing to do. If I didn't have my son around, I would have emptied that sucker completely. The only foods I do still have in my pantry that are not carnivore. I kept some of the canned foods for emergencies in case, you know, like, again, you want to prevent yourself from starving and there's a national emergency shortage of food. There is no food, some, you know, a hurricane. We've had that before or a, a, a freeze where the grocery stores are all closed and you have no food. I do have some canned soups in there and canned foods that will act as a survival bridge along with MREs and some dehydrated foods, which I would never eat normally. I treat the canned food just like MREs and dehydrated food. It's a good backup plan to have, but definitely not something I would choose to ever eat uh, on a daily basis. Um, some other things I, I would do different. I think I wouldn't weigh myself as often because you know once a week is actually enough. Cause really it's the, you, you can tell your weight loss by your belt, uh, by your way your clothes are fitting. And you know, over, weigh, weighing yourself daily is just, it's too much and it's too much focus on the wrong thing, right? Uh, the first week is not about weight loss. It'll happen, but it's not about weight loss. The first week is about adjustment. The second week, you'll start seeing more weight loss and probably get more healing. And then after that, you know, in the first 30 days, you're on, after the first two weeks, you're on to your, your uh, healing mode where you actually, your body starts the new paradigm, the new adjustment to this type of diet. You know, your gut biome is normalizing. You're becoming fat adapted. That could take up to 90 days, but in the first month, you're definitely becoming fat adapted. Your energy level after the first week, you know, into the second, third, and fourth starts going up. Your motivation, my motivation skyrocketed. I don't know what it was, but the standard American diet literally kills motivation. I felt so motivated to do things. I felt like, oh, I need to get organized. I need to organize this closet. I need to shampoo all my rugs. I just felt like crazy energy and motivation come back to my life, which was super awesome. So I think the first 30 days, yeah, that once you get past that week into the week two, week two becomes more of a transition. And when you're starting to learn what your hunger signals are like, you start to figure out what your emotional snacking triggers are. 
you know, you start getting better sleep patterns. And from there, it starts slowly ramping up for the first 30 days where, you know, you just feel like you're gaining control. And that's a big thing. So I was out of control, right? Your hunger signals are actually broken by all this processed food. And it's by design. These guys know that make these foods by com combining seed oils and carbohydrates in certain combinations, they can make you uh, become addicted to them and actually break hunger signals, make you hungry all the time. So you always want to eat. You know, it's like the, when you eat Chinese food, you're hungry 30 minutes later. That's not an accident. That's exactly planning. And that's the reason that McDonald's French fries have 14 ingredients in them. 14. Now, what's simpler than cutting a potato and dropping it in lard and frying it? That's what French fries used to be in salt. So it was like three ingredients, right? You had lard, you had a potato, and you had salt. Now they've got 14 ingredients. They've engineered this food. There's no reason to have 14 ingredients <laughs> in a French fry. So they actually have, I believe, three ingredients in their salt. They have uh, sodium chloride with salt. Uh, they have sugar in there, and they have some kind of uh, metal alloy, uh, maybe an aluminum or something in there. I forget what it is. But they have three things in salt, which is ridiculous, too, because salt is sodium chloride. I mean, that's what salt is. They might have other minerals in it, but it's not, it's not going to have sugar in it, I'll tell you that. So they know by adding the sugar, by adding trans fat, and uh and by adding seed oils they're gonna they're gonna and carbohydrates in a combination they have engineered it to make us very addicted to it and that's part of the reason you have carbohydrate withdrawal symptoms because they've made this drug this bad food that makes you addicted to it so anyway getting off that addiction you're you're gaining control of your body again you're gaining control of your life and it is so empowering i can't tell you how empowering it is to get that control in the first 30 days. Now, are you gonna slip up? Sure, you're gonna slip up. You might go somewhere you didn't plan. Maybe you went to a birthday party. Maybe you didn't plan ahead and eat that burger patty before you went or two burger patties like I recommend or bring a bag of bacon to eat and someone put some cake in front of you and you ate it. Okay, no problem. Get back on the horse, start over as soon as you get home. As soon as you leave that party, it's over. Game back on. You put that behind you, just like a wide receiver who blew coverage and it was six points the other way. You forget that short memory, jump back up and you're going to win next time. So you just got to make, maintain that mindset of, you know, when you get knocked down, you pop back up. You know, that's why I love to see a football player get knocked down and pop back up. I used to play sports the same way. If you pop back up, it lets the enemy or the other guys know that you didn't hit me that hard because look how I pop back up and I'm ready to play. That's what you do. And that is what's called resilience. Um, so I've talked about this before, but resilience is getting back up when you get knocked down. And that's part of building that character, right? You get a habit of getting back up. So let's say you screwed up. Great. Pop back up. As soon as you get home, start over, right? Start right there. You didn't lose much. Trust me. You, you know, it's not over. You're not a failure. Don't quit. Start right there and drive on. You stay strong and you drive on. I tell you what you do. You go and you turn on some YouTubers and follow some success stories and find, and find guys like Dante Fregno who ate Pop-Tarts in the middle of his lion diet. And he still made it, right? He still had an awesome outcome. Your outcome is not determined by one failure. So that's going to happen. So 30 days, you're going to be fighting cravings, you know, and then what's interesting is your cravings go from all the time, like the first week to just like, uh, they're like intermittent cravings. I don't know if you, I, I quit smoking in the, in 1990, I think in the eighties, I smoked when I was in the military and uh, before I got out my first tour and when I quit, it was hard at first, but then it got easier and easier and easier. The longer I didn't smoke, but every now and then, even like two years later, I'd walk by someone who had a Zippo and lit a cigarette and I'd smell that and I'd have an Insta crave like, oh my gosh, that smells good. I don't know if you ever, <laughs> ever had anything like that, or maybe you vape. I've never vaped, but maybe that's the same thing, but you have to get past, and it's easier to get past though. It's like a really insta crave, but it goes away really quick. It's just like something in your memory just tri gets triggered, right? And that'll happen even like right now I'm on day 161. I still, in the middle of the day, sometimes will just get like, probably not daily. This is probably like weekly. I'll just get like this, wow, I could go for this, right? I go for a slice of pizza or whatever. So um, it's going to happen, but it gets way easier to control because you are empowered. And I think that's what the first month is. You start learning your body and you get 
adapt to the changes uh, for the first 30 days and you start becoming empowered. And then you get into month two, which is really exciting. And that's what I'm going to cover in my next video. So stay tuned if you're on month one or if you've already gone through month one. Hey, I tell you what, if you have anything that you experienced, oh, you can see Duke behind me. He's really interested in this. If you can see, if you had anything that you experienced that I didn't cover here, please drop it in a comment below, like and subscribe the video and hit the notification bell if you like my content and want to know more, or if you just want to support the carnivore message getting out. Because by you liking and subscribing, this will get picked up by the algorithm and more likely get out to more people. You know, like I said, when I started carnivore, I was just on YouTube. And one of Dante Fregno's videos, his lion diet video popped up in my feed. I guarantee you the reason that popped up my feed is because someone liked and subscribed his video. And when they did that, he got picked up by the algorithm. And that person, I don't know who it is, but thank you, changed my life and changed other people's lives too that I've influenced. So anyway, that's all I got on this today. Uh, stay tuned and look for my next 30 days. The you know, my 60 day video is coming up soon until later, stay strong and drive on carnivore soldier out.